Here's Davis, California. And Holmes Junior High is right there. Then across the Pacific Ocean, to the southwest of the Hawaiian Islands, is the Marshall Islands, including Bikini Atoll. At first glance, Bikini Atoll may look like a perfect island, with warm beaches and palm trees. But this island has one huge problem. Between the years of 1946 and 1958, Bikini Atoll was used as a nuclear test site for the U.S. military. But before we get to that, let's rewind a little bit. Bikini Atoll is, as its name would suggest, an atoll, or a string of coral islands surrounding a lagoon. The land area of Bikini Atoll is approximately 2.3 miles, while the lagoon area is approximately 229.4 miles. Atolls are believed to be formed by coral growing around the edge of a volcanic island. As the island sinks into the ocean floor, the coral will grow upward, allowing the algae to photosynthesize. The volcanic island eventually disappears completely, leaving a ring-shaped coral reef and a central lagoon. The climate of Bikini Atoll is tropical, meaning it is hot and humid year-round. The average temperature is approximately 81 degrees Fahrenheit and changes very little by season. The rainfall, however, does change. Between June and December is the rainy season, and between January and May is the dry season, as seen in the graph to the right. Prior to 1946, there were approximately 11 families and 162 people living on Bikini Atoll under their ruler, King Judah. The Republic of the Marshall Islands, abbreviated RMI, is an extremely biodiverse region, with over 342 native species and over 724 total species of flora. Bikini Atoll has a large variety of food plants. Some of the ones you may be familiar with are the coconut, banana, cabbage, papaya, squash, and sugarcane. The RMI has a wide variety of fauna as well. Around 1,182 native species and over 5,097 total species, 46 of which are found only in the Republic of the Marshall Islands. The habitat of the gray reef shark is that it lives in the similar to warm waters of Bikini Atoll it lives in salt waters of the Pacific Ocean near the surface. It prefers to feed off larger fish and tends to move in groups. The problem is that the testing of the bombs drove away or killed many of the gray sharks. It took almost 40 years for them to repopulate, and now that other fish have also become uh, populous, it's become a prime fishing area. The food source is about to be rapidly depleted by humans if fishing goes on. It will die out and be driven from its home once again. Gray reef sharks are more common, but they often compete with tiger sharks in the area. The two sharks compete over living areas and food. Occasionally, the two become physically aggressive and attack each other. However, both typically travel in groups. In order to safely test nuclear weapons, they first had to move the natives. They were first moved from the native home here on Bikini, which is nearby Rongara Atoll. There, they were plagued by a shortage of food and were starving before they were finally moved to Lagan Atoll. Lagan Atoll was the location of the U.S.'s base of operations in the Marshall Islands. There, the Bikinians were given shelter in tents next to an airfield, as seen in this photograph. Finally, the Bikinians were moved from Lagan Atoll to a permanent settlement on the small Keeley Atoll. Over the approximately 12 years of nuclear testing, 23 nuclear tests were conducted in Bikini Atoll. Most notable include Abel and Baker, the first two tests, and Castle Bravo, the largest. The Abel test was the first and yielded 23 kilotons. It was detonated on the 30th of June, 
1946. The Baker test was the same yield and approximately a month later, this time at a depth of 90 feet, to test the effects on ships. Castle Bravo was the largest ever detonated by the US, at 15,000 kilotons. The devastating effects of this huge weapon can be seen in this video. Immediately after the bombs were dropped, everything had been destroyed. Many biological organisms were wiped out instantly. The landscape was ravaged and the aquatic ecosystems were torn apart. Land features were ruptured and radiation was injected into the environment for the first time. One month after, the food webs began to deteriorate and disappear. Organisms in the area began to die out. Landscape is tattered and is desolate with little plant life. The aquatic e ecosystems had taken heavy damage. Radiation had spread throughout the environment. A year after the bombs had been dropped, many food webs have, had been disappeared or been damaged. The landscape had been completely ravaged and pioneer plant life began to appear. Some food webs were slowly regenerating, but radiation levels were still very high. Ten years after, the food webs began to reach a normal state again. Landscape is still scarred, but is returning to a stable level. Plant life has reappeared numerously and mammals are returning to the area. Radioactive isotopes began to deteriorate, but are still present. Carbon is blown into the atmosphere after each bomb test. It remains in the atmosphere until it settles on the land. Each of the 23 blasts throughout the 11 years of testing put a large amount of carbon into the air. Carbon returns to the earth and is taken in by plants. Other fallout lands in the ocean, and some debris is absorbed by the ground. Animals decompose and deposit the carbon they inhale. Carbon enters the animals and goes through decomposition and deposition and is returned to the earth. Then the carbon in the earth goes out to become fossil fuels and returns to the ocean. Animals breathe out the carbon into the atmosphere. Currently, the ambient radiation levels in Bikini Atoll are similar to that of the continental US, and the environment has almost completely recovered. There is, however, some remaining damage, such as a crater left by the Castle Bravo test and unsafe levels of radiation in the soil, which can be uptaken by plants. The Bikinians still want to resettle their atoll, but this would be far too costly without significant financial aid from the US. Low-level radiation, mostly from locally grown food, could also have chronic effects on the population. Some possible solutions include simply importing food, which would be quick, simple, not harmful to the environment, but would be expensive short-term and very dependent on another country to provide the food. Another more extreme method would be topsoil replacement, which is long-term and independent, but is extremely devastating to the ecosystem and would turn it into a virtual wasteland. 